Welcome to Massey College. Bienvenue au Collège Massey. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers, and I'm the principal of Massey College. It's my great privilege to invite you here tonight to a music salon. I want to acknowledge that Massey College is built on indigenous lands, the land of the Huron-Wandat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. It is the treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit, and we want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward this land and the great privilege that we have to continue to do our work here. Tonight is going to be a fabulous night. I think we're searching for the blues in the desert, and we are looking to, as always, exploring new frontier about uh, music knowledge at Massey College. And I want to acknowledge that this is part of a new partnership with the Aga Khan Museum, and we're very grateful for this contribution. So let me just pass the mic to Hannah, who's going to lead us through the evening. Hannah, welcome. Thank you, Natalie. Hello, everyone. My name is Hannah Chan Hartley. I'm a musicologist, a Quadrangle Society member at Massey College, and host of tonight's event as one of the members of the programming committee for the Massey College Music Society. Welcome to the second Massey Music Salon for this academic year, and thank you for joining us in person and online. Tonight, we're thrilled to have with us Amir Alibai, Head of Performing Arts at the Aga Khan Museum, and filmmaker and multidisciplinary artist Imran Babur. They will be speaking about the docu-series they created as executive producer and video director and editor, respectively, and produced in partnership with Toronto's Aga Khan Museum entitled Searching for the Blues. When people talk of the blues, they usually mean the African-American music that originated in the US Deep South in the mid-1800s. Music that comes from a universal wellspring of human experience that arises out of hardship and speaks to the human condition. Acting on the conviction that every culture has its own equivalent of the blues, Ankur Maholtra and Ajutosh Sharma, founders of New Delhi-based Amaras Records, set out on several journeys through Rajasthan in Northwest India to search out the Indian blues. Searching for the Blues showcases Amaras's work over the last decade to give artists from Rajasthan, such as Laka Khan, who is of particular focus in the series, a distinct identity. Now, before I introduce our guests, I want to let everyone know that there will be short periods for Q&A or discussion throughout the presentation. And those of you watching online, if you have any comments or questions you'd like to share, please do so in the chat column on the right side of the video stream, and we will select uh, from those throughout. So, introducing our guests. Amarelli Alibai has been actively making and exhibiting visual performance and community-based arts for more than 25 years as a curator, educator, publisher, and administrator. Between 1996 and 2008, he helped to establish the Roundhouse Community Arts Centre in Vancouver, and from 2009-2012, he was executive director of the Greater Vancouver Alliance for Arts and Culture. He has served terms on the board of the Canada Council, oh, Sorry. Since 2012, he has been Head of Performing Arts at the Aga Khan Museum. He has served terms on the Board of the Canada Council for the Arts, the Board of the Canadian Conference of the Arts, and the Provincial and Territorial Advisory Committee of the National Cultural, Cultural Human Resource Council. He currently serves on the Program Advisory Committee of the Arts Management Program at Centennial College and on the Music Committee of the Toronto Arts Council. Imran Babur was celebrated in his native Pakistan as a successful documentary filmmaker, photographer, and teacher before moving to Canada where he has emerged as a multidisciplinary artist and storyteller. From the last mile remote areas of Pakistan to the urban metros of North America, he has sought out stories that are universal in their relevance and has presented them from unique perspectives in multiple formats. His subjects are as diverse as travel, development, culture, politics, art, and artists. He also continues to teach and has trained and mentored many artists who are now accomplished professionals. In a highly polarized world, his focus always is on similarities rather than differences. And his goal as a storyteller is to replace ignorance with information, fear with empathy, and divisiveness with interconnectedness. So please join me in welcoming them. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, um, it's been 30 years now, actually. And, um, and you know, 
it's, it's, it's really nice to be in a room with people <laughs> having this conversation. And I also, you know, welcome everyone that's online. We've become used to that as well, and it, it can be convenient. But there's nothing like being in a room with other people and having these sorts of interactions. Um, so thank you very much for, um, for being here. And, um, and thank you for inviting both of us to be here. We've had um, a lot of things change in our world in the last, uh, in the last months, in the last almost two years. And uh, for myself, I'm the head of performing arts at the Aga Khan Museum, where, you know, f um, and I've had that role for um, almost 10 years now. Uh, before the museum actually even opened its doors. And the conversations were really about, okay, what's this museum about? Um, and how would music, which not, is not usually part of, of the remit of, of museums, uh, be an integral part of, of that experience? And, you know, I think we decided very early on that it was really about thinking of culture as being both tangible and intangible. And museums often deal with objects, and those objects tell stories. But there's, um, there's aspects of cultures in, in order to understand the full diversity of, of, of humanity. It's important to, to pay attention to the intangible, and music is a big part of that. And so that, that has been the focus of the work that we've been doing. And, and the way this docu-series that we'll show you bits of today, um, and also hopefully you have questions and we can have a conversation about it, emerged was, you know, out of the pre-COVID days, we had booked um, Laka Khan as an artist to come and perform at the museum. And he was supposed to come uh, in um, 2020. Leading up to that decision to bring an artist all the way from Rajasthan to, to Toronto to perform came out of conversations that actually took place over years at conferences of all places where you meet other people and you're outside, in my case, having a smoke. And, and you know, I bumped into um, this fellow from India with his partner Ashu and, Amr and Ankur. And over the years, we've talked about the work that they're doing. And Amaras uh, Records, Ankur and Ashu, they started off interested in recording artists in India who were doing rock and roll and, you know, blues and, you know, in the Western sense of, 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 uh, um, of those words. But they also began their own journey discovering artists. And when they went through the deserts of Rajasthan, they discovered entire, an entire community of artists in various places um, and um, started to develop a relationship with these artists, realized um, how precarious the existence of many of these artists was and um, endeavored to record these artists and bring them to the, uh, the attention of people in their own country and outside. And as Ashu talks about this, he goes, it was like my trips in the Delta, uh, discovering these, these, these artists that nobody else outside their community knows about that carry these traditions of songs and music and um, and, uh, and this whole world that Ankur and Ashu discovered was under threat as well. Right? And I think they talk about that in this docu-series. So we weren't, you know, um, I was outside with um, Imran and I said... Having another smoke. <laughs> yeah, having, exactly. Just before this started and... Uh, and I was saying, well, I, I, I want to talk about how this pandemic kind of, like how, you know, it's, this project, this docu-series has come out of um, necessity, about, out of need, that, you know, after all, that's the mother of all invention. And so I asked Imran, I said, well, wh who's attributed, who does that quote attributed to? Like, who, who, who first said that? Who's famous for saying, does anyone here know? 
you know, I think we all know it, that necessity is the mother of, of all invention. Uh, and, um, and then Imran responded by saying, Zarurat ijad ki ma hai. This is how we say it in Urdu. Zarurat, necessity, ijad, invention. Ki ma hai, ma is mother. And I was actually claiming to him, ke, actually I learned it in Urdu back in school. And I believe this comes from our language. <laughs> and probably the English language has just translated it. But it sounds good in both. So I'm not here to claim it, but yeah. We don't know the origin, but it exists in many languages. And I think that, that that sums up how this project came about. But it also is, is, is something that I, I thought um, this idea that Imran comes, you know, it's, 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 oh, that's an Urdu saying. Um, you know, it's like Shakespeare in India. You'll, you'll often uh, find um, very avid, well versed, and um, you know, uh, audiences for Shakespeare. I remember working with a company that was touring in India, and they said, "Well, the weirdest thing is, we'd go in there, and people would stand up and start reciting along with the actors because they knew that soliloquy so well." And sometimes people would come in for their favorite soliloquy and then leave, <laughs> right? And so it was like this culture shock. Anyway, at, at the museum where I work, we're very, very interested in these ruptures and, and, these, and these places where cultures meet. And um, as I worked with Imran and with Ankur and Ashu, started to learn how ecumenical this community is and fluid and influenced and influential. Um, and I think that the, the, the first excerpt that we have um, will set up, you know, if you haven't seen the documentary, the whole docu-series, you, you're, you can see it on, um, on our website. And if you type in Searching for the Blues, Aga Khan Museum, it should take you to the right page. And um, so if you're interested in, in seeing the entire series, you, you're welcome to do that. But we thought tonight, you know, Imran and I uh, picked a few excerpts from the three series that we could show, and then hopefully that, that raises some questions that we can talk about in terms of music and um, also um, this, this interesting story from Rajasthan that demonstrates how diverse, um, I mean, in my mind, you don't, um, when you look at the media, when you think of a, a Muslim musician, this is not what comes to mind. <laughs> so. so are we able to go to yes, the... Yes, uh, first yeah. excerpt. Rajasthani sushi, you said? 
Uncle, there's been a time when we've had to chase down the guard to get this opened. Where does the story begin? Yes, Ashu and I go back decades and it's uh, it's been a shared history growing up, a shared journey and that has involved a lot of music uh, as part of it. And growing up, we grew up with the same frustrations, right? There's music around you, it's mostly Bollywood, it's uh, a little bit of the classical music, some of the famous names, but uh, we were always uh, left searching for something more authentic, something more real. Through the travel company, we were dealing with these artists. Uh, ticket dene mein, our colleague gaya, to usne wo, unki practice. Ho thi. So he basically called me and we heard the music on the phone. Eventually, we realized that that's great music. So that drove us mainly curiosity. Time tak, we didn't know who the Manganiyas were. And uh, generally, we knew these are Rajasthani musicians, leather musicians, and so on. And uh, that's when I went in for my first trip into Rajasthan, and that's when I realized it was like going down the delta. Only thing it was like in Rajasthan and <laughs> it was the desert. Each village had this great musician who had a very different sound from the next. Basically, a jaw dropped with like every village having a gem. It was like that. Tepu. 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 So, who is Lakha Khan? Lakha Ji, at 8 o'clock. Lakha Ji, I just heard this man's name. And... Yeah, there's a player by the name of Lakha Khan. He plays this instrument called the Sarangi. I didn't even know it was the Sindhi Sarangi at that point. And uh, yeah, all the stories uh, that I'd heard from Ashu and from other musicians that uh, he was a difficult man to work with. Uh, he may not be willing to play or uh, there will be negotiations that did not deter us at all. In fact, that uh, intrigued us uh, even more to go and uh, find out who is Lakha Khan. What does he play? When he finally played, I realized, I mean, it was, it was, it was a different level of sound than the music. It just kind of just got me immediately. It was and you had tears in your eyes, basically, during that recording. And I, it still gives me goosebumps to think about then or even now whenever we sit with Lakha Khan. Tulsi kya karo Tulsi ban ko ghas Marzi hui bhagwan ki Gidne 
और सारंगी बजाना सीख जाए तो इसमें इतना साज अच्छा है इसमें लो जवाब है दुनिया उसको पूजने लग जाए और अभी तक सीख नहीं रही है इसीलिए मुझे टेंशन बहुत है क्योंकि हमें उम्र आती रहती है जवानी हो तो वो ऐसे ही करेंगे उसको सिखाए उसको सिखाए सीखने वाला नज़दीक नहीं आता है मेरी उम्र आता आ रही है तो इसीलिए टेंशन हो रहा है कि मेरे साथ में जो कला है वो कला कोई ले नहीं पा रहा है इसीलिए इस बात का मुझे बहुत टेंशन है And when we came across Lakha Khan, he was a man who truly had the blues. He was singing the blues. You could sense that. You could sense the the pain and this uh, sadness in his uh, powerful voice. So there was uh, something magical about that, which uh, you know he was communicating his uh, sense of. Uh, Urgency, his plea. He was perhaps the the last in a long lineage, seven generations of players of this beautiful instrument, the Sindhi sarangi, and his sons hadn't taken on this instrument. They hadn't learnt it, and he was worried that was he going to be the last player of this instrument. He was a worried man, and he was singing the worried blues. That first excerpt, um, I'm hearing the echo. Yeah. Okay. It's gone. Okay. That first, uh, that excerpt is from the first episode, 
And I just wanted to say a couple of things about it before, you know, and you, and you may have questions, is, is that this was made during the pandemic. It was not possible to send over film crews um, and to get footage. We needed an art director. We needed a director who could take existing footage. And that's when, you know, I invited Imran to sort of say, do you think you can work on this project and work with uh, the footage that Amras has, has taken? And, um, and they actually, in further episodes, they took fresh footage um, in 2021. But um, you can imagine that from a director, filmmaker's perspective, that was quite a daunting task um, and many hours of footage to go through. Um, I'm wondering if there are any questions that come up. Otherwise, you know, I'm, I can ramble. Yeah. Yeah. Natalie. Obviously, there's a lot of pain in that, in knowing that your art may die with you. Uh, and that's the pain that we hear. Why is it? Why is it that there's not a, a desire to, uh, to take on the, his art, to take on the instrument, and to carry it forward? I think it's because of um, a changing world. Um, so the Manganyars or the Manganhars, um, there's another um, <coughs> a community called the, the Lang, uh, Langars. Um, they, they all kind of, and they're all Muslim communities that um, for the last 700 years, they, this is how they make their living is by making music. And um, there's been patronage of that. Um, at times, the aristocracy, um, the Rajasthan is full of princes and, and kings, but also, uh, you know, the rituals of everyday life where you would, one would invite people into their home to, to sing at a, at a wedding or a naming or a special occasion. And that would happen both in, in uh, Muslim and in, in Hindu uh, households. Um, Rajasthan has largely had Hindu rulers, and um, and hence, you know, here you have a, a, a Muslim m musician being able to sing with fervor and without making any distinction. You know, he's singing about Lord Rama. He's singing about Tulsidas, who's who's a, a poet and a, um, a, a bhakti poet that's celebrated. A lot of the the poetry that's sung by these musicians is bhakti poetry that. Uh, in, in medieval times was, was the poetry of demo devotion and the poetry of making a personal connection um, to um, God or Ram or Allah or whatever one calls that. And I think that that ethos is still um, there in the music. But that patronage um, has changed, I think. Um, and so it's not possible for a younger generation to make a living. There's also, you know, um, uh, access to a wider <coughs> world because of technology, which changes the desires of younger generations. Like, do they want to continue? You know, their, the opportunities available available to them are different as well. What do you think? I mean, you spoke a lot with Imran. Uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a it's a mix of things. It's a complex question. Um, it's a mix of things. It's also history playing its own role as things change. But yes, patronage structures used to be the princely kind of families. And when that whole thing changed, and now it's a state, and the princes do not have that kind of. So one, the strength, the efficacy of that patronage is no longer what it used to be. And culturally, even though India is known for music and musicians, and me being brought up across the border in a kind of an enemy culture, uh, always thought, ki, OK, we haven't inherited that musical side because in Islam, we are confused about it, at least in various interpretations of Islam. However, I thought even as an ex-Indian Pakistani, 
that in the Indian side things would be different and culturally at least music and musicians would have more <sighs> respect for lack of a better word. But apparently in my conversations with Ashu who is in Delhi and Ankur who is from Delhi but living in the US, I also learned that uh, although it's very hyped up through the Bollywood and everything, but uh, folk music and people dabbling in it do not really have that similar future, nor are they looked upon with any level of respect. So one is that, that, that patronage is going, is dwindling, and uh, there's no easy way of making a living off of it. And then of course, as Amir said, the technology and other access to what life can be is changing the mindset of the younger generation. So when actually Ankur and Ashu met Lakhaji, his eldest son was uh, driving tr a truck or a taxi to make a living. So that was what was happening. And that's not just Lakhaji's own story. It's quite widespread in that community. That and, and But in this story and through what Ankur and Ashu have been doing with their project, I think they are able to at least change some of it and bring some hope back. So yeah, it's a mix of things. Oh, do you have time? We don't. One more. <laughs> one question. No one more question before the next excerpt. Um, I'm just curious. This is one particular kind of traditional music in the area. I know there's others. There's brass bands as well. I believe in in Rajasthan. No. Say that again. Brass again. bands, or they're not like. Um, Never mind. Yes, uh, there, are, there are different forms. This is not the only form. Yeah. So I'm just curious. We're, we're talking about like the extinction of this uh, uh, style and this, uh, and, and with this instrument. Surely other traditional forms uh, are still being practiced. And I also had a question about just the the sense of of unity across um, religions. I I've, I know people who've who've studied Romanian music and they talk about the same band, the same wedding band will play a Jewish wedding, a Roma wedding and an Orthodox Christian wedding. And I'm just wondering if, if this style of music also transcends, uh, transcends that. I think you were hinting at that earlier. Absolutely, I think it transcends. And I think it's the nature of musicians. In many places, I've seen that in, in so many parts of the world where I've worked with artists from those, you know, from Iraq, from, <coughs> from Israel, from, from um, you know, it's often the artists and the musicians in particular that well, they need a band and they don't really, start to split hairs about who, you know, if they need an oud player, it doesn't matter if they're Jewish or, or Christian or Muslim, you know, they're a good oud player, that's what matters. And, and, uh, and that's kind of a cool thing, I mean, that, that one sees with music. And in terms of other folk, you know, traditions, I mean, I think that things go extinct in cultures all the time and, and to hold something so precious as to, you know, I think things evolve rather than going extinct. And um, uh, when it comes to culture, um, um, I think I think that th th they they evolve. And I think the story as it unfolds, I think you'll you'll see some of that, um, for sure. But I think that that's a good question. Keep it in mind because I think that that um, some of the further excerpts will explain some of that. So I think we're going to move on to the second, okay. <laughs> second excerpt of you. I don't know if you have any words to say beforehand. But I, I was wondering if people had questions about the instrument itself. <laughs> Maybe we can talk about that. Um, yeah. Well, yes, I mean, I can save it till later. But I was curious, um, what is the difference between this particular type of sarangi and it, it is a special a particular kind of sarangi? And also, what about makers? Are there makers of those instruments? Well, along with you know the changes that we've seen in in people wanting to learn, there yeah the, there are fewer makers of the instruments, and these instruments are very valued by the people who own them because they know that nobody can make another one. Um, so you know in that same episode, there's a Comanche player who's playing his great grandfather's Comanche because um, you know it's not <coughs> easy to get a new one and. Um, and so they're, they're, you know, I guess they're like old violins that, um, um, that can never be made uh, in the same way again. Um, but uh, they go hand in hand. But I think that, you know, there's some 
there's also, um, again, new instruments that are evolving, right? And just to quickly add to that, instruments are going ex extinct because instrument makers are also going extinct. And part of what Ankur's uh, and Ashu's initiative is doing is also bringing instrument makers back into play. Uh, we won't be showing you any excerpt of that part of the story, but in episode three, I believe, we talk about that aspect also and the work that they are doing around it. So it's a whole ecosystem that they have to then try and conserve and protect. And they're doing it. Yeah. Is the second excerpt ready? <laughs> Just waiting to. And it also exemplifies the ecumenical, the secular nature of the music of the Manganyars, the music that Lakaji sings. It celebrates and praises the gods and goddesses that are worshipped by the Hindu patrons. He sings songs, Sufi kalams, Muslim Sufi songs of praise, of devotion that were penned by the great poets of Multan, Sindh, Punjab of this northwest region of the Indian subcontinent. And he sings songs of folklore, of valor, and to celebrate the everyday occasions of his community. I'm a part of the 
बेकार थी कमकार घर बेकार थी गमला ना दिल नो बीमार देखो वे दिल भर दी केरी जली ने देखो दिल भर दी केरी जली दर्दा दी मारी ओ दिल दी अली ने कोट मिठन दे आओ चिटड़ी मसीते बडूड़े वेले जा पढ़दा फरी दे बडूड़े वेले जा पढ़दा फरी दे दरदाऊंगी मारियो दिलड़ी अली दिलड़ी अली ले सोना ना सुन दावे दुख दी अकीले ब्लूज इज एन इमोशन इट्स अ स्टेट ऑफ बीइंग and that's embraced in the music of laka khan ji every uh, concert every stage we went to we left uh, people crying in fact the nashville concert there were members of you know grammy award winning groups uh, bella tone and the flectones in the audience and you know the first two rows people sobbing the presenter backstage with me both of us hugging each other and you know tears flowing because that's the the magic of uh, laka khan of the sarangi ustad laka khan's contribution in the sindhi sarangi tradition is immense he plays with so much passion love and devotion that there are very few people who can compete at that level and really uh, touching the hearts of many listeners who do not understand what his music background is but he touches the soul as it touched mine Step. It's a great honor and pleasure beyond what we might even imagine. You know, 
know? Because after him, after him, there might be no one. So, so tonight, you should count yourself lucky and fortunate that you have the great pleasure and opportunity to be in the presence of the सचल तू जो जाए सवाली सचल तू जो जाए सवाली कद बिछड़ा मुब मिलाई दो बिछड़ा है मुब मिलाई दो मुख मारा करे बीमारे मारा करे मख मारी दो भला मारा करे मख मारी कद सो जा सज बिछाई दो भला मारा करे मख मारी ऑफ कोर्स आई एम अ ग्रेट फैन ऑफ लख खान it's wonderful to see and hear veteran musicians like this who have the music so deep inside them when he sings his songs which you feel come directly from his soul and accompanies himself on the sindhi sarangi uh, with a warm sound with the shimmering sympathetic strings like a halo around his voice it's it's a fantastic thing to hear and uh, i think amaras records are doing a great job in taking little known musicians like this out to a much wider world in in many ways you can look at the manganya musicians of rajasthan a bit like the uh, griots of west africa the oral historians of of the music <laughs>
these field recordings, we also came across amazing talent, uh, artists who had uh, not performed uh, beyond their communities, beyond their villages, and who were completely unknown. So many things raced through my mind as I was watching that, and I've seen it so many times, and yet, same questions. Um, you know, the Sarangi, you saw the harmonium that they're playing. So the harmonium replaced the Sarangi in Indian music, you know, 200 years ago, 150 years ago. And um, that kind of changed, you know, so it became a lot easier for people to learn it. Because, you know, the Sarangi is played with the backs, like with the cuticles. If you can imagine how painful that is, right? And you're pressing, so you got the strings here, you're pressing up when you're fretting, right? Like you're, you're, so if you watch, you'll see that. So there was, um, it used to be thought that all um, Sarangi players were opium addicts because, you know, it, it's a painful instrument to play. Of course, you develop calluses over time and stuff, and then it doesn't probably hurt as much, but can you imagine? Um, I, I play the sitar and it's hard enough on your fingers. Um, from the front, I can't imagine this. So I, I, I sometimes wince when I watch a sarangi player play, but there's nothing like the sound of it. And you know, uh, it, it, when, when I, I do joke around with musicians when they come to, to, the, to the museum and I, like, I joke that I've banned the harmonium, it's not allowed in the space, <laughs> you have to find a sarangi player, and there are sarangi players uh, around. The Sindhi sarangi, the specific instrument that Lakakan plays, um, you know, is from uh, Sindh, that's why it's called the Sindhi. Um, and of course, during partition, um, you know, uh, there's certain instruments that still exist in Pakistan that are disappearing in India and vice versa. Right, so the last uh, Pakawaj master in India, I mean in Pakistan, died a few years ago, and there's nobody left in Pakistan. But you know, you have to also remember that these communities, such as the Manganhars, exist in Pakistan as well as in India. And, and it was interesting. I when uh, we were making this, and I played um, some of the songs for uh, a sitar player who's from Pakistan. He started singing, he knew the songs, right? And he goes, well, these guys are from India. And he was surprised that he knew the songs that these people from India were, um, were singing. So it's just, you know, it goes to show that those borders and distinctions kind of, you know, sometimes are a little arbitrary. Lord Mountbatten, you said? Is that right? Yeah. Um, so I think that... Um, yes, Lord Mountbatten. Okay. <coughs> so... Um, in any case, I think that that was some, you know, something that I think of when I when I watch. Yeah. And actually, the 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 Dol, um, Dolak player with um, Laka Khan is his son, who's no longer driving a truck and is playing, <laughs> gigging with his dad. Right? <laughs> yeah. So did that raise any thoughts, questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we're just going to get this yes. mic. <laughs> There's a mic. Uh, um, how about it? Oh, yes. Over Thanks for bringing this to us. Uh, the question I had was, you know, you talked about these various threats of loss of patronage, technology, things like that, uh, and being the last generation. I'm just wondering how much is the current politics of India pervaded, has it pervaded to this level, right? Because in a sense, this syncretism is what in, in many ways is that is that serious threat in India right now in terms of the politics. And so I'm just wondering if you know if that, you know, what's happening in, in terms of broader politics in India is actually per percolating to this level and affecting uh, this as a future, I mean, or acting as a future threat to the survival of these local syncretic traditions like this. Um, I'm not sure about current politics, if you're referring to the current regime and what is happening around that. But uh, there is some aspect of this story 
which we felt unsafe bringing into the documentary for the sake of Lakhaji, um, which is not to do with this regime, which is just to do with the overall culture. Around sort of dependent on uh, princely kind of um, families who are Hindu and some other creeds. So that creed system, which is no longer prevalent in the cities in India, my conversations with Ankur and Ashu educated me further that it is still prevalent, doesn't have to do with the current regime. That might have been it was, I don't know. However, the, the thing that really stuck with me was the realization close to where his village is, the closest city is uh, Raj something, what is it called? So, uh, the closest city has this old fort and then the best hotel in the area. So these people would go and camp there to be able to have access to all the villages. But when uh, if Lakhaji was supposed to come and visit them at the hotel, he was not allowed inside the hotel because of the caste and creed issues with the hotel management. And uh, also, I should told me, that, oh, I, I am a travel agent, so I brought a lot of clients to them. So I tried to threaten them, <laughs> but it didn't work. They said, take your business, you are not coming in. And this is after he'd been given awards in India. And really, like, it was not coming from the state. It was just the culture. And it's not prevalent in urban centers. It is the more remote you are, uh, the more primitive sometimes thought processes. Yeah. Yeah. He, was, he was awarded the Padma Shri, which is a very high award in, in India. It would be like a governor general's award here. And, um, and so that story, and I remember we, we talked about, OK, should we make this part of the docu-series? And we thought, well, no, that kind of feeds the monster a little bit. Um, and more than that, also the care for Lakhaji is still being in that part of the world, where yeah. these things matter to them. So if you a the story and then bringing in these aspects, and they are still there, and they are survival, is still somewhat dependent on those other more powerful parts of the society. Absolutely. So that was mostly. Okay. So, actually, yeah, so uh, Angkor did ask Lakaji, didn't he, when we, we talked about it? He probably did, but between me, him, and Ashu, we had already kind of thought about it and thought that it's not worth it, not in this episode, but in this. Mm -hmm. That needs to be a separate story where we are not making his case so prominent, perhaps. But to your question, you know, I think that there's all sorts of narratives in history that are told differently, um, you know, based on, on political interests. And we know this, you know, people are taught to hate others uh, um, in, in, in different places. I, I mean, I can't speak specifically about this. I mean, I know I was reading an article about um, 250 Manganihars. Um, Returning to Hinduism, and this made the papers in, in India, right, as because their ancestors were Hindu, and so there was a big deal made out of out of that, and it was kind of well, you know, that if, if people change their creed, I mean, is that news? Like, you know, why would that become such an important story to tell? So I think that it depends on. I'd love to have this conversation with you, you know, um, as, as well, but, you know, I presented a Kathak dancer from Mumbai um, a couple of years ago, and I asked her to say a few words about Kathak, a classical dance form from India, and she started to describe it as a um, thousands of years old tradition that is mentioned in the Mahabharata, and in this storytelling thing, and so I spoke to her afterwards, and I said, I said, you do know that the Kathakas that are mentioned in the Mahabharata uh, were traveling minstrels and storytellers. That's what's being described in the, in the Mahabharata. And, um, and that Kathak dance, as we know it today, actually was an invention of the Mughal courts. Uh, 
you know, and so that story somehow has been changed. And you know, the, the, the story of music in particular is something that I'm interested in sort of looking, you know, and as a museum, as a place that's trying to do this sort of research, you know, there are many stories that we probably need to tell. We have another question. What? Hey, uh, so thank you for this docu-series. Uh, I just wanted to also comment that uh, I spent my early adulthood in the streets of uh, Rajasthan because I went to one of the schools uh, by the Birlas uh, in Pilani. And I was just looking up some of the villages uh, that you put up, and they just happened to be an hour's drive away from where I studied. So that's really cool to see. Uh, Pilani. I went to uh, the Birla school in Pilani. Um, so one of the things that, I mean, I also wanted to highlight that even though I was just an hour's drive away from fantastic music, it was never really apparent. So I guess, um, having seen Laka Khan's performances abroad, uh, they all seem like classical concert pieces, which typically tend to engage um, a more involved crowd. Mm -hmm. So with the growing digital age and lots more youngsters being on social media platforms, uh, do you think it would be a rather how do you think you can improve engagement of a younger audience with such musical forms? Barmer boys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thought, unfortunately, that's not part of the excerpt that we chose, although I thought it might have been interesting, but all the better that you will go and explore episode three. Barmer boys is also coming in from villages which are probably two or three hours drive from your school. And these are younger, a lot of musicians who are also working with Ankur's uh, music label. And uh, they are bringing that energy of beatboxing and rap and all of that kind of fused into these instruments. So you want to, and others also want to go check out Bomber Boys. From, uh, and yeah, they're named so after the place they're so from. So that, that kind of fresh innovation is probably the answer and what Amir was also talking about. The things don't die away, they evolve into something else. So probably that is one direction that this music and these musicians are taking. No, I, I was going to mention the Barmer Boys. Um, I think that, that you know, um, so the social media is, is really a powerful tool right now, and people are sharing. I mean, uh, Ankur, was it Ashi was telling us that um, he was he uh, you know they were talking about how the Barmer Boys were trending um, in, mm -hmm. in in in, mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. India, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, amongst a crowd that doesn't normally listen to this type of folk music, and there was no previously not much pride taken in it. And now that seems to be changing because of uh, just a f you know, some recordings and it, it people being exposed and they're, they're part of festivals in Delhi and even being seen outside of Rajasthan, right? That's made a difference. I think we're going to move on to the third excerpt of <laughs> tonight's program. Let's wait for that too. It reminds me of a journey with Lakha Khanji. Uh, which began in 2010. And that was a time when, uh, when we met him first, he, he was worried, he had the blues, he was stressed about uh, where his art is going, whether he'll be the last person in his family to play this instrument, uh, for all this music, will it end with him? festivals both in India and abroad with uh, so many tours down the line 
and getting uh, being a Womex selection in 2019 to getting the Padma Shri in 2021. What has this changed for Lakhaji? It's got him that respect, recognition, and money. So this has by itself inspired the next generation to get back to music with the hope that if they can also get the same level of respect and recognition and uh, earn a decent living. And that's, uh, I think, been uh, something that we are extremely proud of. And then there are other moments of validation for us. Moments like when we first heard the eighth generation play the beautiful Sarangi. It didn't start that way. When we first met Lakaji, Dane wasn't even there. He was driving buses and trucks, earning a living. He wasn't in music. He wasn't going to be the eighth generation who's going to continue this uh, tradition. And uh, there were the blues. this uh, course of touring and performing with Laka Khan, Dane, an accomplished dholak player, has honed the art of dholak playing, but over the course of those years, he's also learned how to pick up the sarangi, hold the bow, play the sarangi. And it is these moments of validation to see father and son the seventh and eighth generation together playing the sarangi that uh, make this so special. Laka Khan is coming to Toronto um, this this summer. We hope. Oh. Um, so we we, we sort of made good on that that previous commitment to bring them here. So we will have a chance to do that. 
and you know, it is the 17th anniversary of um, India-Pakistan, and one of the things that I think we can only do in Toronto is actually bring together members from Pakistan and India. So we're planning to bring um, Laka Khan and Trauma, and, I ha and I'm, uh, that's confirmed. And um, one of the things I'm trying to fundraise for and see if, if it's possible is to bring in some Manganhars um, from Pakistan to so they can have a family reunion here. That would be kind of cool. So, um, I think we have time for some questions. <laughs> Natalie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, I was intrigued uh, by the fact that uh, when we are talking about the ninth generation and they were learning, there was, I, I thought the granddaughter was there as much as the, the, the grandson. And I wanted to ask whether, uh, what the role of women, whether you can imagine that uh, women would start playing the instrument or whether that was still a little bit of, a, of an issue and, uh, and uh, where was that going? And I, when, when he comes, we'll be happy to have the, something at Massey. <laughs> There are uh, actually some women artists, musicians that are featured in the docu series as well. Um, and in fact, um, my my Sai, my my Dai, my Dai from Pakistan is a very well known uh, Manganar from Pakistan. I hope you get her. And that's who we were trying to bring to work with Laka, um, so that we would have the male and the female, because uh, that it, there there is a tradition of that, but not always in public, right? Like, so that's a little more rare because, again, there's a, there's a stigma to being a musician in many cultures, but particularly in, in, in South Asia, there's still a, you know, unless you're in Bollywood, it's, it's not uh, glamorous. Yeah. Yeah, f fewer women musicians for sure. But yeah, there are some. Uh, the one that we featured uh, happened Rukma to, Rukma Bai happened to, be allowed so much access and was supported by her family, sort of because of her disability situation. So she was disabled, she'd had polio in her legs as a child. So, and her story was that her mother used to carry her around for her same opportunities back in the day. So she was a dhol player and amazing singer who passed away a few years ago, though, but her work was featured. Um, but yes, far fewer, far similar culture concerns, for sure. But not unheard of. Thank you very much for bringing this to our attention. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the structure of the music, so I'm curious in that. If you think about the analogy with, uh, with African-American blues, there's an underlying structure, but there's a lot of improvisation that was never really notated. So my, my question is, could you comment on that? Is, is this type of music the same in the sense that there is an underlying structure, but a lot of it is improvisation? And if that's the case, is, is it notated? You know, can it be transposed and so on? So that's a really important question. And, and I think you can, because there's notation, it's possible to notate. Um, but the tradition, in, and even in North Indian music, classical music, the classical tradition, um, a lot of it is, is learnt orally and passed on orally and not notated. Um, there have been attempts, actually uh, Pandit Ravi Shankar was one of the first people to, to create a, a notation system that wasn't the Western staff uh, system, but um, a, a way to, to show. And then tabla, many tabla scholars have developed notation for tabla. But again, it, I think it's very, there is, there is something about the intonation and and, and the orientation. And it is the same in that there is a basic structure to the music. It's like the, like the classical tradition where there's 
composition and, um, and then um, resolutions that need to be made. So there's a resolution to rhythm and there's a resolution to melody uh, within a lava, within a song. And so both these resolutions are being found, but the artist is free to improvise um, you know, within that structure. So that's what we like. I mean, one of the things that strikes me in terms of the way it wor this music works with the voice, I don't know about you, but I kept on, I keep on thinking of Celtic music and Scottish music when I hear yeah. the sarangi and, and you know, that, that kind of uh, um, uh, tradition I think is strong. I remember visiting um, Spain um, a few years ago at a conference and we were um, in, in the northern part of Spain and you know, the Celtic influence is still there in the, in the, in the music. And they have bagpipes, you know, um, in, in Spain. And that was new to me. And they're played quite differently than the way they were played in Scottish music. So these connections, I mean, uh, if I were to do it again, I'd be a musicologist. <laughs> <laughs> Another question back there. Um, <laughs> you mentioned that the harmonium replaced this instrument, but I'm curious, I mean, the harmonium is a keyboard reed instrument. Why would it replace a bowed string instrument? Is it just something that's easier to play and you're just transferring the values from one instrument to the next? Or is there some connection between those two instruments I'm, I'm missing? They seem very different to me. They, they, um, the sarangi often would, would, would hold the... Um, the same function. It's, it's about the role that the instrument plays within an ensemble. You know, there's only one excerpt in the whole series where, where it's the instrument is played as a solo instrument playing um, a raga. Right? And even then, it's kind of a, folk, a folky version of the raga. It's like a very distinct um, um, uh, version of the raga. It's a, um, Rog Perry, but th it's about the role I think that the instrument plays, which is about accompanying and keeping the vocal. It's all about the voice, right? The, so it's all about uh, keeping the vocalist um, in tune and pitch, um, and and so it's 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 the guide. So you'll notice that when he's singing, he's not he's following himself with the instrument, leading himself with the instrument. He's not syncing with the instrument. If you notice harmonium players, it's the same thing, that they don't actually sing the notes they're playing. They might play the note they want to sing, right? Or that they just sang. So. Oh, I think we're running out of time, but it's... Well, I need one more. <laughs> one more. Yes, yes, yeah. Do you just need the mic? Um, just yeah. grabbing the... It's okay, go ahead. Just go ahead. <laughs> it might take a while. I'm struggling with the broader theme of the blues. Yeah. As we watch this wondrous music, I'm wondering whether the focus of other parts of the series is really upon the blues as seen through the eyes of Laka Khan. Is it a broader theme of Rajasthan? Is it, a, is it the, this kind of blues elsewhere within Muslim communities within Rajasthan and elsewhere? Or is in reference to castes, or is the, the blues a common theme that you find in other parts of India that reflects through the caste system? I'm just trying to find books that um, tie the blues to more than just this one specific wonderful artist. I mean, we have, we have these conversations, you can imagine, constantly about the blues. Is it okay for us to use that from a musical perspective, you know, because it has particular context and, and history and the meaning. Um, and, and then this idea of the ethos, right, of having the blues and th that, that version of it. Um, but we sort of talked about sort of life is hard. And, and so it, it feels like the blues, you know, the, the blues are often um, the Western blues telling stories of love, of, of uh, being cheated on, of like, Stupid things that happen in your life, or 
you, you know, like, or and by stupid, I don't mean to belittle that. I'm just sort of, I'm just saying, like, everyday, quite mundane things sometimes, right? And uh, this was something that was common in the in the lyric, right? In the, in the lyric that was that was being told, the stories, the sorts of stories that are being told about these stories of longing or these stories of. of, of um, uh, transformation, because we know that in, you know, the blues, um, the lyric in, in the blues has um, different levels of meaning um, as well. Like, you know, uh, during certain periods of history, it was kind of coded uh, to, to speak about um, the, hu the human condition. So really, the blues became about the human condition. But then from a musical perspective, there's, there is a similarity there, I think. Um, uh, and, and so the, the use of the uh, of the the, the minor um, the minor notes in the scale. So we we did a comparison. There's a lot I love Joel that's very popular in the folk music um, of this region. Rag Pervi, Rag uh, Jog, and they have the blue note in them, or the, you know they so. Uh, Rod Jog, we discovered, is exactly the same melody as um, um, God, I can't remember the days. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. <laughs> you, know, you know, that's Rod Jog, right? So, so even musically, there are some, there, there are some connections that a musicologist would be better at um, 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 Teasing out, but that's an important question, and I think that you know, uh, it, there's there's something there um, in terms of that uh, use of certain. Um, but there's a certain um, imprecision that's purposeful. That's a precise imprecision that happens in the singing that uh, I was hearing uh, when, I, when I heard Laka Khan sing, and that I hear when I hear, you know, um, Ray Charles sing, you know, or um, the saying that slightly off the blue note right, that, that makes it in some ways the blues. I, I hope that was a sufficient sort of response. And but to part of your question, just to finish this, no, the documentary does not try to elaborate on this aspect as much. So that was also part of what you asked whether, whether in some episodes, no, it doesn't try to justify or elaborate on this. But it takes a little note from there, and it's just really fun. Yeah. And the sarangi means a hundred colors, right? Uh, that's what the word sarangi means. Um, the last episode is actually called "A Hundred Colors of Blue," right? Mm -hmm. So it's this again trying to find that, uh, as Imran's bio says, the similarities, right? Um, uh, across humanity, in terms of you know, what, what, what do we sing about as human beings, and and uh, and what's important, what sticks around, right? Like what becomes our oral tradition. We all, we still have those, I think. Well, I think we have to to wrap up, unfortunately. But thank you so much. Join me in thanking uh, Mr. Albai and Mr. Babor for this wonderful presentation today. Thank you. And I believe you can stream the whole series on, on the on Yeah, the it's just, you just go yeah. to our website if it's searching, it's called Searching for the Blues, and um, on the Aga Khan Museum website. And I don't know, if, is there anywhere else they can find it? I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether you put it on YouTube or not. I'm not sure. Probably anyway, this is the guy who saved, um, saved the day. <laughs> this is incredible. <laughs> Well, thank you. So thank on you for having us. <laughs> <laughs> on behalf of the Massey College Music Society, thank you to Alyssa Ginsberg and Matt Glanville for producing this event. And thank you to all of you who have joined us here in person and also online tonight. We hope you enjoyed it. And we have two more events coming up in February and in March, the details of which we're currently finalizing. Please stay tuned. You can follow um, Massey College on social media. And also subscribe to the YouTube channel if you want to, um, and also check the website uh, for these upcoming events, and we hope you'll join us then. So thank you again, and good night. Thank you. <laughs>